Well, good morning, Providence. Good morning. How are you all? John Adams, our nation's, uh, one of our nation's founders and second president regarding our Constitution said, our Constitution was made only for a moral and a religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Hardly the words of somebody or of a group of people who were seeking a freedom from religion, but rather a freedom for religion, namely the Christian religion. And though our present moral and religious crisis may cloud the facts, when we look at our nation's founding and our nation's founding documents, we can still be proud to be Americans. And even more importantly, as Christians, we can be glad, joyful to be citizens of heaven with Christ. So together, let us celebrate as God's people our dual citizenship. Standing together, let us sing, I love thy kingdom, Lord, hymn number 405. to say to you, O Lord, we just ask you to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from that which is unrighteous in our lives. We pray, O God, that you would anoint us with your spirit and speak to us in this, in this hour. We thank you, O God, for a nation uh, where we can assemble openly and in our community and peacefully uh, in this house that has been prepared for worship for you. We thank you, O oh God, for what we believe to be the greatest nation on earth. We ask you, O oh God, to continue to bless her in accordance with your will and your purpose and plan. We thank you, O oh God, to that end that we live in a place where uh, we are free to worship you and to bow before you and to seek you through the power of your Holy Spirit. So we do that even now, O oh Lord, and ask you to be with us in this time that we spend worshiping you uh, as a family of believers together. And we do that in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, again, good morning, good morning. and welcome. We're glad that you're here this morning. As I was telling someone on the way in, happy 6th of July. Um, it is not the 4th of July today, but this is 4th of July weekend. Uh, and so we do celebrate today together our nation's birthday as we worship the Lord. We'll uh, do that together. Uh, and we uh, welcome you to this service of worship and celebration. If you're visiting with us today, you're not just a visitor, but you're our warmly welcome guest. And we're glad and delighted that you're here. And if this is your first visit or the first time in a long time, if you would 
look there in the pew pocket in front of you and let us know that you've been here with us today by filling out a, a visitor's card and dropping that in uh, the offering plate uh, as it goes by. And to that end, if you have not had an opportunity, home folks, to speak to some of our visitors this morning, this is a good chance to do that during our fellowship hymn, our fellowship chorus, as Brother Sean comes to lead us. Let's stand again. of reading say some words from Psalm 67 Lord bless and pity us shine on us with your face your praise O gracious God let all the nations sing The nations you will judge and lead them in your ways. Let all men praise your name, O God. Let all people praise. The earth her fruit shall yield, for God our God will bless. We shall be blessed, and in all the world his Lord shall confess. Amen. Please be seated.
Will you bow with us as we pray together? Oh God, we are grateful that in the things that we have to look forward to, the things that give us joy, the things that nurture our spirits, that one of those, th one of those things is that one day our Redeemer is going to come again and receive us unto himself, that he's going to take the church home to be with him, to live forever, to sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb, and to be anointed his bride forevermore in the presence of our holy and loving Father. Lord, we're thankful for this joy, for this knowledge that you've given us, that you've left us with, and knowing that this is going to transpire. Lord, we thank you, O oh God, today for uh, this nation again, for uh, all of those who have given their lives through the years to um, uh, that we might have freedom, that we might stand here today and freely and openly proclaim the Word of God. We thank you today for our young men and women who serve far from our motherland uh, in, in battles to keep peace and to make freedom uh, a reality and to continue that reality in the days and years to come. Lord, we pray your blessings upon them. We pray that you would draw near to them and comfort them and care for them. Lord, we pray for so many of our number today who are not with us and others, oh God, who uh, for whom we know and others that we may not know who deal with the issues of sickness and illness. Lord, some who deal with the issues of grief and loss, we pray for them today. We lift them up to you and we ask you, O oh God, to nurture them and to bless them in the ways that you see fit. Meet that need that's in their lives, O oh God, as you see fit. Lord, we just continue to uh, pray for our church and the work that we seek to do. Lord, for the days that are coming and the work that you give us to do, Lord, we just pray your guidance uh, that we might be found doing and working in accordance with your will and your purpose and plan. Lord, we continue to uh, pray for this morning's hour of worship. We pray that you would speak to our hearts, feed us, nurture us on this day that we consider and think about our citizenship and the greatness of all that you've given us and provided for us and promised to us. Lord, we just pray this prayer and give it all to you in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Well, uh, just a few things that need to come to our announcements this week. This is one of those busy weeks on the schedule. Be sure to remember that we have uh, deacons meet, meeting this week on uh, tomorrow night. Uh, deacons will be at 7 o'clock. And then, of course, on Tuesday morning, our WMU is meeting. And... Uh, they've got some stuff on the board outside. I see that already there, and uh, they're already getting ready and uh, prepped for that meeting. It's birthday uh, week over at Pinewood, uh, Pinewood Harbor. Seems like those birthdays are kind of like mine. They begin to come here and here, don't they? <laughs> but it's already birthday time again over at Pinewood Harbor, so we encourage you to be a part of that and be with us as well. Our worship time over there with Brother Dale leading in that, and uh, Brother Herman uh, sharing in music, and we have a good time and are always blessed by that and encourage you to be a part of that. Of course, our business meeting is Wednesday night, and you'll want to be a part of that as well. And then all of the other youth and music things that are uh, usual during the week, just to be a part of all of those. Uh, please be sure to read the announcements on the back regarding the, uh, the VBS and uh, our uh, uh, preparations for that. Uh, as well, plus the meeting uh, that's coming up. And I believe that uh, our campers this week, we had, we sent a group of campers. I know that by uh, Thursday afternoon, they were tired of hearing from me because they were on their way home and I was a, 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 a nervous uh, uh, parson, I guess you'd say, because I kept calling them all afternoon to find out where they were and, uh, and if they were about to get home with the storm coming and the wind blowing and the rain coming down, but they made it home safe and sound and we're grateful for that and they had a wonderful week and I'm going to ask Brother Bobby if he would to come and say just a word and then I'm going to ask our campers, each one, if they would to come and share just a word with us. I want to use this mic because I want the choir behind me to be able to hear. Uh, if I get through this without it raining, it'll be a miracle. So I doubt it's going to happen. <laughs> what I'd like to share first is I didn't want to go on this trip. I, just, I really did not want to go. But 
I guess God spoke to me sometime back and made me realize there's nobody else to go to drive so the boys could go because they couldn't have went if somebody, man, had not have went. So I went. It was one of the greatest experiences of my life. To see that many children, I call them children because they're so much younger than I, a standing and a praising God with their hands uplifted and shouting and praising God. That many at one time. It's just so amazing. And those kids, if you think they went just to play, you're wrong. They were in church and Bible study in one day more than you were all week. I promise you that. And they really enjoyed it, and I'm so glad they did. But I'd like to share right quick just a few three things that God blessed me with while I was there. He blessed me with a lot of things, but these are the three greatest things. And one of them, I like for to stand up and face the audience. But I didn't know this was going to happen. But I looked up on that big stage. Who do I see? I had to ask Leo, was that Brittany? Because he looked at like her. And it was. And they played a song. And these eight girls signed this song. She did a wonderful job. She never messed up the first time. I watched her all the way through. And I just wanted to say I'm so proud that you blessed me a great deal. <laughs> One of the other blessings I got from being there, stand up and leave. I wanted to, to me, I don't know much about this, but after Bible study, we started out. Leo walked up, wrapped his arm around me, and says, Thank you, Mr. Bobby. You don't know what went through me right then. No, that young man was so appreciative of me going so he could go. And I thank God that he got to go. You sit down, brother. And the third blessing was at the end, Thursday afternoon, when we started to leave. I didn't know this was going to happen. Miss Shirley and all of them, and we're fixed. I didn't get in the van, all came running up to me to hug my neck and take a picture of me because they were so thankful that they could go. And I thank the church for supporting these kids. And I say to any of you that have children and have the opportunity to send them to camp, please do. They've been well taken care of and learn a lot about Jesus. Thank you. <laughs> It's going to be a, a brief thing because we're waiting for our DVD to come back from um, the Fuge Camp, uh, what we did up there. And, and unfortunately, most of my pictures that I took on our camera that was ancient, um, apparently the card was corrupt and I lost them all. So all I have is pictures that some of us took. Um, with our cameras and I'll get those together and, and one Sunday night we'll come and we'll let the kids give a testimony and, and show you just what went on at camp. Um, it's amazing. Um, I've taken kids up, uh, younger kids up, and this is my first time with the teenagers I've taken up. Um, it's an awesome experience. Um, even for us adults to go, it's just, it's, just, it's just incredible to immerse yourself in God 24 hours a day and that's all they do up there. That's all they have. There's no TVs. There's no radios. There's nothing. There's just immersing yourself in God. If you don't have anything to do, the Bible's sitting there for you to do it. Um, but anyways, I'm going to make this short. Um, I do want to give this picture to Pastor. This is our group of Fuge the first day. And uh, to thank him for supporting us and allowing us to go there. Thank you, Miss Shirley. Um, well, missing today. They had prior engagements that went with us. Um, I saw each of these children grow in a different area, um, each and every one, and it was amazing to me. Um, especially one told me that it was better than Disney World, and I took that as a very compliment because they went to Disney World last year, so they should know. Um, I'm going to call the kids up right now.
and I'm just going to ask them a quick question, and they're going to answer two questions for me, so you just give just a little bit. So, Leo and Sunshine, and Brittany and Noah. Come on. Okay. All right. I want you each to name at least one thing that spiritually that was your favorite thing before we were up there. Uh, Leo? The Bible study group. There were so many people there. And I don't normally make a lot of friends, but not only they taught good lessons when I made friends. So. Uh, I'd have to say the same, the Bible study group. I mean, we were only there uh, three days, but these uh, almost like 30 people that we had in our Bible study group in that three days, we learned to come together as a family. It's amazing. Um, I have to say praise and worship for me because it was just so uplifting. I have to say the same, praise and worship. It was an awesome experience. And what was your favorite thing besides praise and worship? Awesome. Um, the next favorite thing, I guess you'd say, that you got from yeah. I gotta say, I've never been in a cafeteria like this. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was amazing. They, had, they always had two different choices, and one book you always liked, and they had so many things up there, like a buffet, just <laughs> one turn, though. So you just got one. I mean, it's not I could have hated it all, but uh, also we had nightlife, and is where you either did some cool game and it was first night that we did nightlife we uh we did this little game where you had to find a secret hidden church and if you got caught you got thrown in jail and uh, i got caught and then i converted one of the soldiers so i got to go back out but they like stampeded me as soon as i got out <laughs> Uh, well, I have to say probably the uh, recreation time we did at the, uh, at the top of the hill. I mean, they were games, but they weren't just pointless games. Each game had a, uh, had a whole meaning behind it about our walk with God. Yeah, I would have to agree with that. Recreation was not a second favorite. It was night life. That was fun. And when they talk about recreation hill, you know, it's it's uphill, it's like this. It's not really uh, it's more like a yeah, that's more like a mountain. Uh, <laughs> and I went up with these kids every time, so when they complained, they couldn't say, well, you didn't walk up the mountain. I walked up every time they walked up that mountain, I walked up too. And um, I have to say one of my, I told my kids, one of my aha moments was um, we sang a song and it talked about walking in the light and being alive and then how God is alive. And as a church, we need to walk in the light and be alive. And um, I told the kids we need to learn how to be more excited that when we come into our Bible studies and our, and our worship services and whatever we do for God, to be alive and act like we're alive, not just act like we are just sitting here going through the motions. Amen. And um, so you can learn more about this. I hope you all come back to the night that we have scheduled for, but we'll get scheduled for the um, camp so they give a little more of their testimony and actually see um, what you guys supported in here. And it was an awesome thing that you guys supported. We thank you very much. Amen. Thank you, Miss Shirley and crew. And uh, we are going to give them a time on a Sunday night coming up. Uh, they will have their uh, video and they're going to do more of their testimonies and give you more in depth. So uh, you have had a hand in supporting this and them uh, going to camp and having this opportunity. So you be alert about that in the bulletin and uh, be with us on that Sunday evening so that you can see all of the things that they did at camp and some of the pictures of that. Just a word if I could, um, I want to say just a uh, uh, a heartfelt sympathy to the family of uh, Detective Darren Jones. Uh, many of you know uh, Darren, knew Darren. Uh, he was uh, 49 years old and died suddenly of a heart attack last weekend. Uh, and uh, Darren was a wonderful uh, person uh, and a great guy and a, a very competent detective in our Holly Ridge Police Department. Uh, he's going to be sorely missed in this community and um, 
Uh, we just to pray for him and his family, and we pray for our police department, uh, who lost a wonderful part of themselves this week, and a, a, a wonderful man. Uh, and we pray for them as well, and I ask you to continue to hold them in your prayers. We also are enjoying flowers today that were placed here by uh, Miss Lena Carr and her family and uh, in memory of uh, Mr. Durrell. And uh, they are beautiful flowers and we're going to enjoy them all day long and we thank her for them, uh, for the beautiful flowers and we certainly remember uh, Mr. Durrell fondly and with, uh, with great love. Any other announcements that need to come to our attention? My brother Sean. Continuing our worship, let us sing our offertory hymn, hymn number 809, God of Our Fathers, which is our national hymn, by the way. Let us stand and sing.
Alrighty, while the choir is coming down and getting in place, if you would turn with us to the book of Philippians, and this is our final Sunday in Philippians. Let me take just a, a moment, if I could, to say that um, uh, we're sort of taking a new direction beginning next Sunday. I want us to take a look at the structure of a New Testament church. Uh, the Bible, the New Testament, outlines for us what a New Testament church ought to look like. And we are to gauge ourselves by that roadmap that the New Testament gives us. And, of course, probably uh, the uh, heart of that not only is Jesus and what he taught us and how he lived and, of course, examples that he gave to us, but Paul's writing to 1 Timothy. So we're going to pick up in 1 Timothy next week and go for a few weeks and looking at uh, the structure of the New Testament church and what it ought to look like, what we ought to look like as a New Testament church. Um, some very revealing things that I think uh, the book of Timothy, as Paul writes to his young uh, son in the faith uh, and talks to him about this, some very interesting things that will come out of that for us that we need to be looking at. But today we're going to wind up our, our weeks of joy in Philippians. Philippians chapter 3, we'll go back a chapter was not the last chapter but we'll go back to chapter 3 and begin with verse 20 verse 20 of chapter 3 but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there the lord jesus christ who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body would you bow with us as we pray together Father, we thank you for this scripture. We pray now that you will work around and through and above our frailties in this moment, that you might speak to your people, feed us from your word, through and by the power of your Holy Spirit. We sincerely pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, I guess I understand human nature well enough to understand that probably some of you have had about all the joy that you can take because we've spent these many weeks now talking about joy and all of this stuff about being positive and maintaining an attitude a good attitude and and uh, having a, a a positive attitude and it may be beginning to wear thin on us just a little bit some of you may say look i, I must not be living in the same world that you're living in you don't have to work uh, where i work you don't live in the same family, apparently, that I live in. You don't live with the people and the problems that I have every day, or you wouldn't be looking at the world with such rosy-colored glasses. The world is not that great, and things are not getting any better. Matter of fact, things are getting worse. So in a world that's like this, how can we have this joy? How can we maintain this joy? What impetus do we have to have this kind of joy in our lives in a world that is beset by all manner of evil and wickedness, and you and I are right in the middle of it. Maybe not as much in the middle as some are, but we certainly bear our share of the brunt of the evil and wickedness of this world, and of course are tempted by it. In this world in which we live, it can kind of get to be confusing to sort out after a while. A.W. Tozier wrote an interesting thing in his book, The Root of Righteousness, and I just love this. I think this is so indicative of the paradox of Christianity, of how on one hand we are this, but on the other hand we are that. A.W. Tozier says this. He says, a real Christian is an odd number anyway. He feels supreme love for one whom he has never seen, he talks familiarly every day to somebody he has never seen. He expects to go to heaven on the virtues of somebody else, not his own. He empties himself out in order to be full. He admits that he is wrong in order that he might be declared right. He goes down in order to get up. He is the strongest when he is weakest. He is the richest when he is poorest. He is the happiest when he feels the worst. He dies so that he can live again. He forsakes in order to gain. 
He gives away so that he can keep. He sees the invisible. He hears the inaudible. And he knows that which passes all knowledge and understanding. Wow, what a paradox we Christians really are if you stop and think about it. Because every one of those, you can quote a scripture to go with it to support it. Well, in verse 20, in the same sort of way, Paul draws a contrast, that same contrast of the hopelessness of the future of the unsaved and the gloriousness of the future of the believer, the joy of that glory. Paul says in verse 20, Our citizenship is in heaven. We eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies. and They'll be like his glorious body. Paul says you and I are living in a tough place. We do not even imagine, we cannot imagine the toughness of this place known as earth. If you think of all of the battles that we fight every day as God's children in this place, we battle, battle fights with pain, with suffering, with separation, with hardship, with grief. We don't even understand what we are dealing with here and will not understand it until we see the glories of heaven. Paul writes in another place, I has not seen or ear has heard the glorious, the glories of that which shall appear. We don't understand the fullness of heaven. And because of that, we don't understand the awfulness that we live in every day in this place. But we're not really citizens here. If we're God's children, and we're going to talk about citizenship this morning and how it applies to being an American, to being on the 4th of July weekend, but where we are, our citizenship really is. If we're God's children in Christ Jesus, then we're citizens of a place that's much better and far greater than anything that we'll ever know here. And Paul gives us three, I think, distinct reasons in this scripture this morning why we ought to have joy. And with the assurance of joy. And Paul starts out by saying, we ought to have joy in the presence of all that we go through in this life. You say, how in the world can I maintain my joy? Paul says this way, number one, you need to be remembering every day the assurance of a heavenly home. Paul has already gone through this and he begins in verse 20. You'll see verse 20 begins with a conjunction. It begins with the word, but our citizenship is in heaven. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, Paul wrote, uh, writes these words. He says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now that word conduct, conduct here uh, in, uh, in verse 27 I love that word. If you look back in the Greek, and here we go with some of those Greek pronunciations again, but if you look back in the word, uh, in the actual Greek translation, it's polituma. Polituma is the word we get the word politics from. Now, I want you to listen to this very carefully. That word politics means to behave as a decent citizen. To behave as a decent citizen. Boy, did that word backfire on us, huh? Politics, polituma. Well, in the 20th verse, Paul uses that same word again, but here it's translated citizenship, and it has to do with one's behavior as a citizen. Paul used an analogy here of citizenship that would easily be understood by the Philippians. They would know exactly what Paul was talking about because you see, Rome would create these little communities of army veterans. They were called garrisons and they would colonize those garrisons around the Roman Empire. They'd put one over here, one over there, one out there where they had um, uh, had conquered uh, an area uh, of the world. They would put one of those little political garrisons out there and they would colonize that. And the Emperor Augustus had extended this practice when he came into power by giving full Roman citizenship to all of those people. So if you lived in one of those colonial garrisons, then you would have full Roman citizenship. You could vote. 
Uh, you could uh, write to your senator. The, yes, they had senators back in Rome, much like we have senators in Washington. That's where our, our founding fathers uh, got their idea from democracy, was from the Greek and Roman philosophy of democratic government. So, yes, they had a Senate. And those settlements of, vet, uh, of, uh, of veterans and other citizens uh, were given rights and privileges, the same rights and privileges that if you lived right there at the center of government in Rome. And these provincial communities held the same rights and the same privileges. And in return, they were expected to live like Romans. If I lived in a Roman garrison, if I was a Roman colonist who lived in one of those outposts, then I was expected to dress like a Roman. I was expected to eat food like the Romans ate. I was expected to behave like Romans behaved because I wanted, my, my job was to perpetuate the Roman way of life in that colony. That's what Emperor Augustus wanted to have happen. When he colonized those little garrisons, he wanted the people who live there to live like Romans so that that Roman way of life would eventually flourish throughout the entire globe. There was a, a, method, a madness to that methodology. Well, during New Testament times, the, the city of Philippi, where this little church that Paul had established, that was a Roman garrison. That was a place where Roman citizens lived, even though they may not have ever been to Rome. They were considered Roman citizens. They were a colony. And when Paul later wrote to the church at Philippi, he underscored that meaning of church membership, that illustration that his readers would understand. We are citizens if we are now in God's family. We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. James Moffat, in his book, Christian Theology in Plain Language, puts it this way, and he translates this statement even more strikingly. strikingly. He says, we are a colony of heaven. If you are a child of God this morning in Christ Jesus, then you are living in the colonial period of grace. You are living in the colony earth because this is not your home. Heaven is your home. You are living just as they lived in Philippi. So those Philippian Christians would have understood exactly what Paul was meaning when he said you are citizens. Because the city of Philippi, although located geographically uh, in Macedonia, was considered to be a colony of Rome, and therefore its citizens were considered to be citizens of Rome. And though they were, in fact, many miles from Rome, they were still to live and to act and perpetuate the Roman way of life. Their conduct is regulated by Roman's law, uh, Rome, Roman laws, Roman culture, Roman uh, ways of living, Roman history. And they are loyal to Rome because they are answerable to Rome's emperor. Therefore, those believers who lived in Philippi had an even higher calling than being citizens of Rome. They're citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Well, just as Philippi was a colony of Rome on foreign soil, the church is a colony of heaven here on earth. You and I are colonists by grace, awaiting that time when we go home. Christians are temporary residents of the earth, but we're citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And heaven is not just a place of future abode, but heaven is a place of which we're saved and we are presently citizens. And as colonists of heaven, our names have been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We are citizens of that kingdom. We are on its registry. We have a passport in and out of the gates of heaven. And we are loyal to heaven's call. We are answerable just as the people at Philippi were answerable to Augustus Caesar. We are answerable to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And our citizenship is important. Because while we live in this place, colony earth, our job is to live like the people back home. Our job is to live 
lives that are heavenly. Our job is to live in a way that proves our citizenship. We are to live in a culture of heaven. We are to live in a culture of grace as Jesus taught us. And according to Luke chapter 10, verse 20, when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your name is written in that Lamb's book of life. And that, that word written is used in the present perfect tense. That means it is ongoing. It never ends. If your name was written in the Lamb's book of life, then it is written in the Lamb's book of life. And it forever will be written in the Lamb's book of life. And no, not only can we be joyful of that, not only can we be joyful because we know that we are citizens of heaven, that we live in a colonial region known as earth, and one day we will live at home with our blessed Redeemer. Not only that, but we have an anticipation that one day he's coming back to take this, uh, this colony known as the church home to be with him. And Paul says that in verse 20. If you look there in verse 20, he says in the second part of that verse, and we eagerly await a Savior there, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that means that he is coming for us to get us and to bring us home the greatest day in the event of a colony. When a colony was looking forward to the coming of its emperor, when the thought of Augustus Caesar coming to Philippi hit the streets, man, they started getting ready. The buildings were clean, things were made ready, food preparations were done, security was managed. They were getting ready for the emperor to come. The most elaborate preparations you possibly could hope to be made were made as in anticipation of his arrival. Well, folks, this morning, the colony of heaven here on earth, the, the, the colony known as the church of Jesus Christ, Paul said, eagerly awaits his coming. We eagerly await the coming of the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. We eagerly await that time when our Savior, Jesus Christ, will come. And that has been our stronghold through the ages. That has been one of those elements that keeps our joy intact. That is one of those elements that we look forward to, even in a world that seems to be crumbling around us, in, in a world where Christians take it on the chin more than we ever have before. We remember things like Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, when Jesus left us from this earth and he said, after after this, he said, after this, uh, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight, and they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. And when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them, men of Galilee, the very first promise that was given to us after Jesus left this earth. Why do you stand here looking into the sky? Because this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And then he promises us in that wonderful chapter that John writes in John 14, chapter 2, Jesus promises us and he says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If There's plenty of room for you there. And if it were not so, I would have told you. But because it is so, Christian brothers and sisters, my children, Jesus says, I go there to prepare a place for you. And then on over in John chapter 14, verse 3, he goes on to say that it's not just a place that's prepared, but if I'm making all these provisions for you, then one of these days I'm going to come after you and to receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. The blessed hope of the Christian life that gives us so much joy is that we are not left here by ourselves. Not only were we sent to us uh, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, to live with us, to guide us and to nurture us, but we know that one day our blessed Savior is going to come again and take us unto himself. That we are just foreigners in a strange land, Paul says. Our citizenship is in heaven. Our hope in the scripture is the confident expectation that this is a reality. It does exist and it will happen. You know, we use that word hope sometimes to mean, well, I certainly hope she gets here on time. I certainly hope that car is the right color. Well, that's wishful thinking. That's, that's an uncertain hope. This is not hope 
that that's that this is not that kind of hope this is a certain and sure hope that is as certain as jesus was taken up one day on that road in galilee he will one day come and receive the church to himself as a matter of fact the early christian church the greeting of the early christian church was maranatha if I would see you, I would take your hand and probably hold it tightly and look into your eyes and say to you, Maranatha, dear brother, Maranatha, dear sister. That means our Lord one day comes to us. That was the greeting of the early Christian church. What helps me to maintain this joy that I have in my life, knowing that one day my Savior is going to come and put a stop to all of this, and, and this world is going to be finished. And there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And I'm going to be able to live there eternally in the presence of that one who gave me life. The third thing that Paul says here, and this is one of my favorites too, because the older I get, this becomes more and more precious, is that one of these days, this old body is going to be transformed. Now that's a promise, that's a promise. I didn't make that promise. Paul didn't make that promise. That promise is made to us in God's word. Paul says in, in, chapter, in um, chapter 3, verse 21, he says, Who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Paul assures us that, that what Jesus says about that, that one day, we are going to be transformed and conformed to the glorious body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean we're going to be a part of his body. That doesn't mean we're going to look exactly like him. That, go that means that we're going to be exactly as he is. When you see Brother Sean and I walk down the street, you can tell that we're both human beings. Why? Because he doesn't have long ears and a furry body. And because I don't have big, e, uh, uh, big feet and a snout nose, you can tell we are both human beings. We don't favor each other. We don't look alike. You could tell him from me in a minute. But we are both human beings. When you see me in glory, you'll know me as I am, but you will also know that I am a child of God in Jesus Christ because my body will be glorified in the body of Christ. It will not be the same body. It will be my body. You will recognize me, but because of him, this body will be transformed and glorified because you see this body, every day I tell a little more, I can tell a little more that this body was not meant to be an eternal body. It does not have the characteristics of eternality. It hurts a little more. It has more pain. It's slower. It's diminishing. Every day I know that this body is less and less than what it was a year ago because it is not an eternal body. It was not designed. Uh, actually, originally we were designed to be eternal, but sin stole that from us. Sin robbed that from us when we decided to walk away from God. But he has redeemed us through Jesus Christ, and so now we have the opportunity of transformation. A body that will and can function like a human body was intended to function before it was destroyed by sin. John chapter 1, or First John chapter 3, verse 2. John says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it is not yet revealed what we shall be, but we know this, that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we, we shall see him as he is. I know that it's getting late, but I kind of want to share this with you. Some of you have heard me share this before. One of my favorite thoughts about this is after Jesus was glorified and came back to earth, one of the things he did was he knelt on the shore at Galilee and fried fish and invited the boys to come gather with him. Now that is, as, that is as human as you can possibly get, but Jesus was not only human, he was God and he was glorified. Man, if I have the opportunity to kneel down by one of the lakes of heaven at a fish fry with Jesus, won't that be a wonderful thing, knowing that we'll never leave and never go away. And everybody who's there with us, who loves us, will never leave us or will never go away. Paul says so eloquently in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 54 through 57, 
He says, so when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the, the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God Almighty who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul says if that doesn't get you joy, if that doesn't, if that doesn't give you joy, then you've lost your way to Joyville. Because that is the very foundation of our joy. Joy is because we await the transformation of this old body. Paul says, how do we maintain that joy? How do we keep that joy in this world that seems to be falling apart all around us? Because we have, number one, the assurance of a heavenly home. And number two, we have, um, uh, we know that one of these days that God is going to send Jesus. Jesus is coming back. And when he does, he's going to take the church out of this world. And the events that follow that, and we've talked about all of that in, in months past, the events that follow, follow all of that are uh, this world will be uh, destroyed and recreated. There will be a new heaven and a new earth for you and I as God's children to live on. If you're a child of God in Jesus Christ, we can be joyful because one day he's going to come and make all things new, Jesus is. And we can be joyful this morning because he's going to be transformed, these old bodies, these bodies that are decaying right before our very eyes that are not eternal bodies. One day it's going to be an eternal body. And I'm going to live eternally in this body in the presence of the one who redeemed me. And in the presence of God our Father who loves me and created me. In the presence of those whom I've loved and known here on this earth. Be joyful. I can celebrate the 4th of July for, because I live in the greatest land on this earth. And yet I'm just a colonist here. Because I'm of the, I'm of the, my heaven, heaven is my home. I'm living in a heavenly colony known as the church here on planet earth. And I'm here in an outpost, but one of these days, I'm going to be able to go home to a new heaven and a new earth, and I'm never going to leave it. And so are you, if you're a child of God in Jesus Christ. And if you've never given your heart and life to him, that's what you're going to be missing. When this earth is destroyed, that's going to be the end for you. You're going to spend eternity in a miserable and dark place, a place outside of the presence of love outside of the presence of God. But if you're his child through Jesus Christ, you're going to spend it in eternity in a glorified body in the presence of the one who loves you. This morning, if you've never accepted him as your savior, as Brother Sean, as our musicians come and prepare to lead us in a hymn, if you've never given your heart and life to him, now is the moment for you to do that, to make preparations for that time because we're never promised tomorrow. Or maybe you need to come and recommit your life. Maybe you haven't been living in the culture of heaven like you need to. Maybe you haven't been the heavenly colonist that you've been called to be to spread the culture of heaven on earth. Maybe you need to come and recommit. Maybe you need to come and, and uh, join this church. God is calling you to be a part of this fellowship. Whatever your need is this morning, as Brother Sean comes to lead us. Hymn number 774, let us stand and sing. When the roll is called up yonder, will you be there? Amen. 